my shop beer no evil But thanks to King George and his rainbow cabinet Today murder is legal God, I know that it's wrong To kill my brother for what he hasn't done And it's some things like in the sky It sounds like heaven is falling It sounds like heaven is falling You promised me a new day at dawn And I see a thousand points of light Like so many points of hatred, shame and horror U.S. Air Force is pounding large parts of Iraq and Kuwait to dust, killing no, no one knows how many people. American troops are about to march into what could be a meat grinder. There are two countries fighting this war, the United States and England. 
despite extreme U.S. pressures and threats. Few others have been willing to give more than token support, except for the family dictatorships that rule the Gulf oil producers. In the region, opposition to the U.S.-British war is so extreme that it's turning into mass popular support for the hated tyrant Saddam Hussein. Why are the United States and England virtually alone in fighting a war that almost no one else wants? It's something that we ought to try to understand. Let's go back to last July when the Iraqi dictator was George Bush's amiable friend and favored trading partner. True, he was a murderous gangster who had set up maybe the worst tyranny in the world. But you could make plenty of money trading with him, and it looked as if he was our thug, so therefore he was quite okay. On August 2nd, everything changed. The State Department had let Saddam Hussein know that it had no serious objection if he settled some border disputes with Kuwait by force. But he took over the whole country. That's not acceptable. This region is U.S. turf, and no one, and that means no one, is allowed to strike an independent course. The Iraqi dictator therefore changed overnight from a moderate whose behavior was improving to a new Hitler who had to be stopped before he conquered the world. He had stepped on the wrong toes, ours. There were two very different reactions to Iraq's aggression. The first was at the United Nations where the Security Council immediately imposed sanctions, and that means sanctions and diplomacy. That means negotiations to arrange withdrawal as the sanctions take effect. That's actually the usual U.S. response to U.N. response to aggression. Usually that response is blocked by the great powers. Uh, the United States, in fact, is far in the lead with Britain right behind it. Usually they support or carry out aggression themselves. But the two warrior states happened to be opposed to this act of aggression instead of supporting it, carrying it out. So they allowed the UN sanctions to be imposed. But the US and Britain at once moved to undercut the peaceful means prescribed by international law. Sanctions were undercut by dispatch of a huge expeditionary force to the desert instead of a small deterrent force which could be kept in place while the sanctions took effect, as they were almost sure to do in this case. And the U.S. and Britain made it crystal clear that they would not permit any form of diplomacy. Now that's important to understand. The official story is that George Bush went the last mile for peace, turning the force only after extraordinary diplomatic efforts were exhausted. Those are the words of the president. And no one expects a government to tell the truth, but that's a bit too much. From August, the U.S. position has been explicit, unwavering, and unambiguous there will be no negotiations. Washington has been happy to deliver an ultimatum saying capitulate or die. That's not diplomacy. Official reasoning on this was spelled out by New York Times diplomatic correspondent Thomas Friedman uh, last August. He said that the administration feared that a diplomatic track might, in his words, defuse the crisis at the cost of a few token gains for Iraq, perhaps a Kuwaiti island or minor border adjustments all issues recognized to be negotiable. Anything short of capitulation to U.S. force is unacceptable, whatever the consequences. At just that time, the U.S. had received an Iraqi offer for a settlement in very much the terms that Friedman outlined. A government Mideast specialist described the offer as serious and negotiable. It was instantly dismissed, as were subsequent proposals from Iraq and others. The last known example was disclosed by U.S. officials on January 2nd. It was an Iraqi offer to withdraw completely in return for agreement on the Palestinian problem and the banning of weapons of mass destruction. U.S. officials described that offer as interesting because it dropped any border claims. A State Department Mideast expert described it as a serious pre-negotiation position. It seemed that it might be enough just to express willingness to deal with these two outstanding issues. George Bush's response was a letter to Saddam Hussein saying that there would be no negotiations, capitulate or die. Now the official reason for this is that the United States can't reward aggressors by allowing what's called linkage to the Arab-Israel conflict and the elimination of weapons of mass destruction, as Iraq has in fact long requested. But we know for certain that the official reason is a fraud. The U.S. commonly rewards aggressors and pursues elaborate linkage even in the case of far worse crimes than this one. Furthermore, 
the U.S. had rejected a diplomatic settlement of these two outstanding issues, including Iraqi offers, long before the invasion of Kuwait. The U.S. has rejected diplomacy because it opposes a settlement of the Arab-Israel conflict that recognizes Palestinian rights, and it wants Israel to retain its hundreds of nuclear weapons. Since the U.S. is virtually alone in the world in this stand, apart from Israel, it rejects diplomacy and therefore rejects linkage. That's the plain and simple truth of the matter. Why have the U.S. and England insisted on rejecting a diplomatic settlement which might well have ended the crisis without war? To answer this question, we have to ask just how these two countries are different from others, and the answers are pretty clear. The U.S. and Britain are the two countries that imposed the imperial settlement on the region, and they naturally arranged it in their own interest. The settlement they imposed guaranteed that the United States and its British ally would control the richest energy reserves in the world and, crucially, would benefit from the enormous profits that they yield. These profits have given very substantial support to U.S. and British corporations, financial institutions, and their economies generally. The essential points captured by a joke going around Wall Street. Question. Why do the United States and Kuwait need each other? Answer. Kuwait is a banking system without a country, and the United States is a country without a banking system. Like a lot of jokes, it's not a joke. There's a second major respect in which the U.S. and Britain are different from their allies. They have troubled economies, but they have a near monopoly of force. With the Russians having withdrawn from the world, there's no longer any deterrent to their use of force. It hardly comes as a surprise that the two warrior states want to establish the principle that the new world order is to be ruled by force, in which they reign supreme. That's not a pretty picture, and it's going to become much uglier if the citizens of the two radical militarist states allow this to happen.